Don't make me sit up here alone. Come on, kids. Come on. Seriously. Ugh. All right. Show him what it's like to be young hey, again. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? All right. So today's story, you guys, is a little bit interactive. I'm going to need your help during portions of it, OK? So what I need you to practice saying is, I'll tell mom about the lipstick bit. All right. I'll tell mom about the lipstick bit. All right, you guys try it one more time. Ah, this figures very heavily into the story. So now, when I was a little boy, and, and pretty little, because I wasn't going to school yet. I was, uh, let's see, who's in kindergarten? Okay, so, all right, I was about your age, because my sister went to school early, and I went to school later. And back then, it was just me and my mom and my sister, all living in a house up in uh, northern Minnesota. And we didn't have very much money, because it was just the three of us. So we didn't have a lot of things, all right? My mom had one tube of lipstick. And I always thought that was the coolest thing. Have you ever watched your mom put on lipstick? Yeah. You guys ever watched? Yeah, how how, how are the lips kind of look, you know, yeah, I mean, they look okay. But then she takes the lipstick, and then she puts it on, and then it just looks amazing. Huh? As a little boy, I thought that was cool. Your mommy does, has, what's it? Yeah, see? And it looks cool, right? And it was this cool process where she would, she would put it on, and it was just this amazing thing where she'd just swipe it across, and amazingly, her lips looked amazing, right? So I thought it was the coolest thing ever. But we were not allowed to touch mom's one lipstick because putting on lipstick is a bit of an art form. Let me show you. All right. See, lipstick, if you're doing it right, apparently, and, and I don't put on a lot of lipstick, lip, lip gloss maybe, on occasion, when nobody's looking. All right. But what you do is you turn this up and see how the lipstick gets taller and taller? All right? So normally now, when someone puts on lipstick, they only put it uh, like maybe this far, so it's enough where they can, they can do what they need to do. Well, I was kind of new to the whole lipstick thing, so I was going to try it out. So I rolled it all the way up, and I put it up against my lip, and, and it didn't seem like it was doing anything, so I pressed harder and harder, and it fell off. Just like that. Oh my goodness, I was terrified. Because my mom was not one of those people that dealt well with adversity. We, we got something. See, you guys, when you guys get in trouble, what happens? Do you guys get timeouts? Uh, I, I, see, this is what I did back then. All right. So my mom was a big spanker. If you got in trouble with my mom, you were getting a spanking. And I was not a big fan of spankings. So I put it back on there as best I could, and I rolled it back down, and I put it there, and I, I just hoped, I hoped, oh, hopefully she won't ever, you know, get it all the way up there or anything like that, and it'll be fine, right? Mm -mm. When we were getting ready to go pick up my sister, she pulled it out, and for some unknown reason, cranked it much higher than she normally does, and when she put it on her lip, it just went, bloop, and it fell down. And I watched my mom's face go from perfect shade of white to a brilliant shade of red. She was so mad. She was so mad because that was her only lipstick. So she looked at me and she said, who touched my lipstick? And you know what I did? What any red-blooded American male would do. I stood up and I said, Sue. <laughs> I lied. I blamed my sister. Only other person in the house, I said, she did it, right? Uh-oh. So when Sue came home, mom said, you want to tell me what happened with the lipstick? And what do you think Sue said? I don't know. And my mom looked at her and she said, you broke my lipstick. And you know what Sue said? No, I didn't, right? Because she didn't, she didn't know any better. Oh. That made mom really mad, because now mom thought she was lying to her. So Sue got not just a spanking, but a really, really big spanking. Oh, she got in big trouble. 
Oh, big, big trouble. She was crying afterwards. Oh, later, she came over and she looked at me and she said, I know what you did. <laughs> and you know what? Of course she knew. Who else was there to blame? Mom didn't break the lipstick and I'm the only other person in the house. We didn't have a cat, right? Oh, so I thought, all right, we're done with it. We're done. Well, a couple of days later, my sister had been sitting and stewing about that. And she was still pretty angry with me. And my mom said, you two, before we're going anywhere today, are going to clean up your rooms. You're going to make your bed, and you're going to get all your laundry into the laundry room. I said, okay. So I went in, I cleaned my room. And my sister came in, and she said, you need to get in there and go get that laundry out of my room and go put it in there, and you need to make my bed. I looked at her and I said, why would I do that? And then you know what she said to me? What'd she say? I'll tell mom about the lipstick bit. Oh, she had a new tool in her arsenal. She realized that I was so scared of mom and scared of getting in trouble myself that she could use that. So you know what I did? Because I was scared, I went in there and I made her bed and I took her stuff to the laundry room and I was mad but there wasn't anything I could do, right? I'd have to go tell mom and I'd get a spanking. Oh. So a couple of days after that, I had gone over to the neighbor's house and I had done some stuff for him. And uh, he had asked me to uh, uh, kind of help him move some stuff around and stuff like that. And he was just a neat guy. I think he just came up with reasons to uh, uh, give us money. So I went over and I helped him and he had given me some money. So I went to the store and I bought myself a little candy bar and a little pack of hubba bubba bubble bubble gum. You guys ever had hubba bubba bubble bubble gums? No. Oh, good stuff, yeah, it's good, good gum. Back then it was the gum, right? All right, so I bought that and I came home and I was so excited and I was just about to eat my candy bar and my sister said, nope, that's my candy bar. And I said, why would that be your candy bar? I went over and did all that work. And you know what she said? I'll tell mom about the lipstick bit. Oh, fear in my heart again. I was like, oh, no. Fine. I gave it to her. This went on and on, you guys. Years, <laughs> seemingly. <laughs> Years later. She would pull that out every now and again. I remember we had uh, to watch our uncle's dog. And my sister said, one second. My sister said that she would help watch the dog. And he was this basset hound. Have you ever seen a basset hound? They're really short, they're really long, and they go all the time. Oh, so much barkers, all right? And this dog had an amazing magical ability. He could make the most gigantic poops ever. It was horrible. And we had to clean it up out of the yard. And he was here for like a week. And do you know how many times my sister cleaned up the dog poop? Not one. You know why? Because every time it came time to clean up the dog poop, and mom said, Sue, get out there and clean up that dog poop, Sue took me aside and said, what'd she say? I'll tell mom about the lipstick bit. Ah, that lasted forever, you guys, and I was so scared. One second, no, 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 like, yeah. That lasted forever until finally, you guys, finally I'd had enough, and I still wasn't much braver. I waited until my mom was really, really, really sleepy. And she was laying on the couch, and she was like half asleep. And I went in there, and I said, Mom, remember years ago? Years ago when, when, when you had the lipstick and it broke? And she said, yeah. And I said, that was me. And she goes, yeah, I kind of figured. She goes, because it seemed like you were stuck doing a lot of stuff for Sue for a long time. So she knew all along, you guys, what would have been happening. But she knew that that punishment was far worse than anything I would have gotten otherwise. <laughs> what I learned from that, you guys, is that forgiveness is there if we go and ask for it. If you really, really mess up, don't let it linger. Just go and say, hey, I messed up. Because all of us have messed up. Your parents have messed up, you know. They've broken stuff. They've done stuff bad. You know, all of us have. And even as adults, we need to go to Jesus. And we need to ask for that forgiveness. 
Because once you're forgiven, you just feel great. It's like a weight lifted off of you. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah. Wow, you are way smarter than me. Yeah, no, I should have bought lipstick, and then we'd have been good, right? <laughs> All right, you guys. And I want you to join your hands. Even bridge the gra gasp here uh, in these aisles. I want to read you something that I think is very important right now. Have you ever been at the end of your rope and you felt like there's nothing left? You know, at the end of the rope, we can only hang on if it's tied in a knot, right? And once that knot is there, the rope is a different purpose, you know? And I feel, I just feel strongly that somebody here feels like they're at the end of their rope. I know I've been there and maybe I'm still there. But I know that with these friends and with this church, you make the rope, you tie the knot. Every one of these hands that are held here is a knot in these ropes. And you know, it's so important. We feel the strength in these ropes, do we not? It is so important that we keep this knot going. You know, and that little knot could be you just saying something nice to somebody doing something nice. You don't have to thump a Bible over somebody's head. That's not what these ropes are about. This rope, these knots are to hang on to. You know, and I thank God for hanging on to me. And I know he hangs on to you, every one of you guys. So let's pray to him. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for the knots you have given us. You gave it to honest Calvary. You hit, you not as we go, as we're growing and growing and growing. You know, you keep gaining on us. You keep nodding us. You keep us strength. We have strength in this church. I thank you, Lord. I thank for Wayne and his recovery. How many times that he's knotted the ropes for us, for one, some of us. I thank you for the healing and for the, I pray for the healing on some of these that are in the bulletins. I pray, pray for the people, a granddaughter or a daughter that is left and she's out there. May we be the knot to bring her back. Lord, I just thank you so much. You are so grateful. You are a Jehovah Sham. You are there to provide for us at all times. You are so great. Lord, we thank you for that. For Jesus' sake, amen. They asked me if they needed help getting that up there, and I said I'd cowboy up. <laughs> and I didn't know until just then that I'd be able to do it. <laughs> That's heavier than it looks. Uh, it's good to see you all. And uh, Vera, thank you for that beautiful prayer. And, uh, you know, it, it is such a tangible, tangible reminder that we are a community, lifting each other up, holding onto each other. And uh, 
And yes, amen to that uh, prayer of thanksgiving for Wayne, who is back in the land of the living. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, he, I, I was visiting with him yesterday and talking with him, and man, I mean, he, he's just amazing. And God is, is good. God is good. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, uh, I thank you. I thank you that you are more than enough for everything that is going on in our lives. That you are constant, that you are faithful, that you are true, that you are unchanging, that you supply our needs, that you are personal, and yet you are the creator of the universe. Lord, I pray in thanksgiving for the miracle that you work, that you take words prepared through the life and through the um, preparation of one person, seeking in faith to understand the message that you would have delivered, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you carry those words out with something for everyone because we are all unique and special, like a fingerprint. And each of us has special needs. And you are the one who can take the words from one mouth and supply the needs of everyone. And I thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a boy, about seven years old, six and a half, seven years old, I had a recurring dream. I was Ricky the Cowboy. I loved that dream. I, 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 I just looked forward to going to bed each night to dream about the next adventure. And I suppose it was only natural because of the age that I was living in, the age of television, where there were stars, cowboys, that, that would ride in and rescue the day. There was John Wayne. Oh, I'll tell you, Pilgrim. Yeah, all right, how's it? And James Arness, you know, in the, is Matt Dillon, and, and there were all numbers, any number of names, and, you know, the thing that was beautiful about it was that good always triumphed, you know, which is, which is an ancient theme that goes back thousands and thousands of years, that good triumphs over evil, you know, and, and it just seems to be hanging in the balance, and then the hero walks in and takes care of the situation. Yeah. Um, but my ultimate all-time favorite program was dun -dun 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 Bonanza, you know, with Little Joe. My favorite was Hoss, you know, Dan Blocker, you know, that big teddy bear. And, and uh, you know, he had Lauren Green, Paw, and, uh, and Adam, you know, he's dressed in black. He didn't last long on that show. Um, and so that's, uh, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, the, I, loved, I loved the theme of good triumphing over evil. And in my, in my dreams, as Ricky the Cowboy, I couldn't wait to go to bed at night and, and, and live the next adventure. Now, um, people ask me with, with this, uh, with this uh, question of Ricky the Cowboy rides again, where's your horse? Well, Ricky the Cowboy didn't need a horse because Ricky the Cowboy could fly. Yeah, and whenever, whenever there was a need, whenever there was a need expressed or there was trouble, you know, I, I could fly to the problem and take care of the problem. I would be there for the weak and defenseless. I would take care of them. I was always the hero. And good always triumphed over evil. But the dream suddenly turned to a nightmare. That dream turned to a nightmare when my dad ended his life. When my dad ended his life and Ricky the cowboy wasn't able to save him. Yeah. Now I was afraid to fall asleep. My dreams had turned into nightmares. My, my fear was like this movie reel, and you know, you'd see the countdown, three, two, one, there were, the, a gun would appear, and, then, and I, I just was afraid to close my eyes and fall asleep at night. 
But the nightmare wasn't only in my dreams. The nightmare was also in our neighborhood because we had a three-generation neighborhood where all the people lived in that neighborhood. My mother was raised in the house we lived in. And the stigma of the kid whose father took his life clung to me like a stench. And all the kids with their dads, you know, would, well, it, you know, it just was, it was, it was hard. And my mother had to go back to work. Um, she got married young, and, uh, and she didn't even have a high school education, but she's a brilliant woman. She got her GED, she taught herself to type, and went back to work. And um, there was, there was, I mean, I could tell you a whole bunch of stories about how our family turned chaotic, and uh, how drugs and alcohol and all kinds of stuff came into, into, into my life. And I felt like a reject. And I felt, I felt like anything but a hero. I remember one day that uh, uh, my mother was talking about our names. And, and she said, Richard means a strong leader of men. And I felt so mocked. How could I ever, ever be anything? I think one of the other things that happened through that period is I wondered, as a seven-year-old going forward, where was God in this whole situation? I mean, God kind of went to sleep. He went away with that whole idea of good triumphing over evil. I remember sitting on a bar stool next to my uncle who was over drinking again, and I found out for the first time that my dad had taken his life. And that's the way I heard about it, because another uncle had told me it was something very different, that, that a, a blood vessel had ruptured in his brain. <laughs> but hindsight is twenty twenty, And I recognize that God was not distant through those growing up years, through the traumas, through the losses, through the struggles. God brought me through experiences God brought me through, um, to, and people crossed my path that made a difference in my life, that, that, that were anchor points of stability and encouragement. And, you know, God actually was very present, even though he felt so distant to me as I was going through those struggles. And I, I dare say, perhaps you're feeling that God is silent for you right now that you might be going through something where you're wondering where God is in, in your personal struggle, whether it's a health struggle or whether, it, whether it's just the rigors of aging or whether it's having trouble at school or, or trouble within relationships or within your family and your children. And, you know, it's any number of things. Perhaps you feel that your prayers are hitting a ceiling of brass, that, that, that your prayers are not getting heard. And hindsight is twenty twenty, isn't it? And um, so through those times, <laughs> through those times, I struggled. I struggled at school. You know, all the things they say about trouble, trouble at home or trouble in your life affects your academic performance. I, I didn't believe in myself. I... I struggled terribly. But God brought people into my pathway, as I said, and not least significant is Cheryl, who I met in high school, and her family, which was a haven of, of security and stability. <laughs> not a perfect family, but a lot better than what I was experiencing. The girl of miracles, I, I called her in, in the first year that we were dating, she still is. In our faith journey, we were involved in the Presbyterian Church and had a couple of children's choirs and, and a, a youth group. And as, as our children started coming along, we were very, very engaged in the Presbyterian Church and started to feel that presence of God when, um, when I got a job offer in St. Louis. We always thought that we would stay in Buffalo, New York forever. I think a lot of people have. And, and um, you know, I, I love Buffalo, but it is also a good place to be from. Anyway, 
<laughs> hope my family's not watching. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we, um, we moved to St. Louis, and we were isolated. We were alone. We had left our family and friends behind. We were very prominent in the church that we were part of. And all of a sudden, we, were, we had no friends, no family. And uh, uh, we did find a church, but it was a large church. We felt like God led us there, but we were just not noticed. We sang in the choir. But a, a very powerful thing happened through that period of time. Cheryl tells about looking out the back window of our house when we first were there for the first months, looking out the back window of the house and saying, God, did you move here with us? But we started awakening. And um, I, I don't have time to tell the whole story. The bottom line is we, we felt strongly impressed to get debt-free and ready for a move. We sold our house. And, and rented a house and moved on to a street where there happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist family with children our children's age. Bottom line is they had an evangelistic series. They were praying for us. We joined this little church that had, it was built brand new, but it only had a congregation of about 60, and there were 20 of us baptized all together. And the pastor asked me, he said, have you ever considered becoming a pastor? And, and through the process of the evangelistic series and Bible study and, and, and gaining friendships, almost instant friendships, spiritually based friendships in this church, all of a sudden God was so present, so personal, so immense, and so in touch with us. We started... We started exploring it and praying about it. And I left my job, a very successful job in product development where I had traveled around the world, where um, where uh, enjoyed uh, a couple of joint patents on products that were created. I left that job. And off we went to Lincoln, Nebraska. Again, alone. No friends and studied for two years. Studied for two years at Union College. And I, I, I want to share something with you in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are God's masterpiece. And I use the New Living Translation because I love that. Um, instead of just saying we are God's workmanship, we are God's masterpiece. You know, in the world, I felt like a reject. I felt like I didn't fit. I felt... I felt like I wasn't enough. But, but God calls us his masterpiece. He calls us his own. And, and I've learned that, that we cannot do anything to make him love us more or love us less. Because God is love. And the more I've experienced his love, the more incredible my life has become. I look, at, look back at it from this point, my life is a miracle from where I was, from a, a rejected, at one point suicidal guy to, to feeling like a masterpiece. And, and, and knowing this, that I, what I am today, I'm not yet what I will be tomorrow because I can see the trajectory of my life and what God's done in my life. Do you know him? Do you know him? Because he makes all the difference. It says we are his masterpiece. And, and don't miss this. He has created us anew. And, and I like that because, you know, for those of you who don't, who don't know, my last name is New. So I was born anew, and I start a day, every day anew. Yeah, there you go. And, and so it, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us, don't lose this, don't miss it, the good things he planned for us long ago. There was a time in my life where I thought I would never go anywhere. But as Jesus takes hold of my life 
And as I allow him into my heart more and more, his plan is getting worked out in my life. And his dreams, to borrow from Blackaby, his dreams are much bigger than mine. The Word of God says that He is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we can ask or even imagine, beyond our wildest dreams. If He does it for a person like me, from where I started out, how much more can He do it in your life? Because your story's not done being written yet. Right? We've... (laughs) We've, he's, he's working in all of our lives. Felt the call to go, to leave our familiar surroundings again, and to go to Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> and study. And I told him, I had to be done with my theology degree in two years. Oh, my goodness. I already had a bachelor's degree, but talk about intensity. I had to put in anywhere from 19 to 22 hours a semester, and it was practicums. You know, I had a church assigned to me. There was all kinds of... There, at three months after being out of school for so many years, I, I remember sitting at my desk feeling like nothing was sinking in. My recall was nothing, and I said, Lord, did I come all this way and pull my family out of this just to fail? (laughs) But God has plans for us. In John 15, verse 16, uh, we just recently talked about, I am the vine, you are the branches. And remember the prime directive, not to bear fruit. Our prime directive as Christians is to stay connected to Jesus, the vine, If we stay connected to him, we can't help but bear fruit, right? And so he he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. As a matter of fact, all we have to do is look at at the book of John where it says, for God so loved the world. That means that God chose everyone. He chose us. But we have to answer. Our opportunity is to use the free will, the choice that he gave us to answer the call, yes. To answer the call, yes. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Anything that makes God more famous in the world he will, he will do it. You know, people made a difference in my life because they were people of faith. They were people who connected with Jesus. They were people, even those who didn't, that Jesus used, make a difference in our lives. He made us to be community. This community is called to be a contagious community that reaches out to people and makes a difference in their lives. And it doesn't matter where you're working or what you're doing. You are a minister. And the only thing that separates me from you is I have the privilege of being a full-time employed minister. We're all ministers. Christ is the head of the church. I'm a component in the body of Christ. Not the head. Jesus is the head. We are all, all connected directly to Jesus. And that's what makes the body work. So often, you know, we fall into the trap of the Israelites saying, we want a king like the other nations. No, the truth is Jesus is the king, and we are all his subjects. He appointed us to go and produce lasting fruit. Sometimes that fruit is just a smile or a handshake or inviting people to come and join hands in the aisle and pray before the Father. Sometimes that fruit can be an anonymous gift. Sometimes that fruit can be a word of encouragement. Sometimes it can be pointing somebody to Jesus in an in a, in a obvious way. So 
Let's go back to the story of Ricky the Cowboy. After two years of school at Union College, I achieved my theology degree and had my first job lined up in Beatrice, Nebraska. Now, you might think it's Beatrice, but it's not, because if you're in Nebraska, you have to do as the Nebraskans do and call it Beatrice. You got to put the emphasis on the right syllable. <laughs> so, I was in Beatrice, and we had our first house. And, um, and Cheryl, it, it, was a, it was a nice house, not too big, but it, it did have three bedrooms. And in the front, in the front uh, living room, there was this pocket door that opened up into a nice little space that could be used as an office. And Cheryl said, you know what? You need to get a desk. And I thought, wow, I felt so affirmed, you know. <laughs> you need to get a desk and, an, and a chair and a, and a filing cabinet. So we went to Goodwill. All right? So we went to Goodwill. And, um, and we found, remember those old steel desks? They weigh about uh, 350 tons. You know? They're durable, right? So we found one of those old steel desks, and uh, the price was right. I think it was $35. And uh, checked out the drawers. Everything worked. You know, everything was good. And uh, in this particular case, Goodwill would deliver, because we were down in Beatrice, didn't have a truck, and so they delivered the desk. And uh, I sat down, and um, as I, as I uh, opened up the file drawer, get by with a little help from my friends, as I opened up the file drawer that was empty when we looked at the desk, I found these boots. These boots. Now, they're pretty fancy. And, um, and I thought to myself, wow, I, I, I remember that dream, right? So um, I want to fast forward just a little bit of time, to a lady named Kim Janicek. Kim is, a, is an equine artist in rural Nebraska. And, and she, um, she was our first Bible study. And uh, she, we didn't find her, she found us. She came in, in three snowstorms where the elderly congregation in Beatrice said, oh, we just closed the church. She sat outside the church for three weeks before it was finally opened, and she came in and introduced herself. <laughs> so I told her the story about my dream, Ricky the Cowboy, and I said, and I found these boots. And she asked an obvious question. She said, did they fit? Well, it never even occurred to me to try them on. So she says, go get them. This is one of her drawings, by the way. Pencil and paper. And there's one hanging in my, this is hanging in my office. So, so I went and got the boots. They looked about the right size. Now, bear with me because I'm not used to doing this. Everybody was asking me, uh, where are your cowboy boots? Well, I couldn't answer that question. But anyway, here they are. They fit. Now, the thing is, they do pinch a little bit, but then so does ministry. There we go. So when I put them on, Kim proclaims, Ricky the Cowboy rides again! <laughs> now, I tell you this because God spoke a prophecy into my life 
through the form of a dream when I was a little kid with a tough road ahead of me. He gave me a promise without me even realizing what it was. And when the time came for me to enter into the career that he had intended for me, he provided my pair of boots to mark the beginning of my career as the real Ricky the Cowboy. <laughs> you know, God is good. Now, eternity is set before us. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul talks about this. He says, God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. And when Paul says us, he's talking about us. It is not, it is not exclusive to one person or any group of per persons. It is available for everyone through the power of Jesus Christ. And even if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart and you think, you think it's all out here, no, the Holy Spirit is working in us before we even know who he is. Because God, God has prepared a work for us before before we were even conceived in our mother's womb. Because you see, you read Psalm 139, and you'll see that God conceived us in his heart and mind before we were ever physically conceived in our mother's womb. And that means that everyone was conceived in love. It doesn't matter where you were physically conceived. <laughs> because I think I was conceived someplace other than within marriage. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I know I was. So, <laughs> again, I hope my family's not watching. Anyway. <laughs> We're all family, right? Okay. <laughs> In 2 Corinthians, now I'm speechless. What do you think, Evan? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. This is, the, this is the promise of our God who came into a world that didn't want him, that didn't know him. He had been misportrayed and, and distorted and made to look like a tyrant, capricious, demanding, exacting. And Jesus came into the world and loved a whole world that rejected him. Because he said, you are worth it, you are mine, I love you, I have graven you in the palms of my hands. Are you in need of a new beginning this morning? Is God speaking to your heart right now and, and you feel like, as Vera shared, that you're at the end of your rope? But if you're at the end of your rope, you're not. Not. Yeah, like that? Because, because God is holding you in the palms of his hands. He's reaching out to you even now. And you know, sometimes we get... We get complacent and worn out in, in, in the life, and we can know things in our head, but in our heart, we feel cold. And, and we may have known Jesus at one point, but, but that relationship has grown cold. I want you to know that Jesus never grows cold on you. He never gives up on you. He has dreams for you and plans for you and has desires to give you a future and a hope. And, you know, I love that about that, that, that he, has, he gives us hope and a future, you know, in, in, um, in uh, Jeremiah 29. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Do you realize those, those words are inseparable hope and a future because without hope you have no future and without a future you have no hope my dear friends <laughs> Ricky the cowboy rides again I prayed in here earlier this morning 
very early this morning, 4 a.m. I want you to know that I, I walk to this church from my house that's close by with a reflective vest on, because Cheryl wants that. I walk around this parking lot twice and pray for those who will be in the parking lot. I pray through the hallways. I pray in the foyer for those who will be entering. I pray in our classroom wing. And then I come in here and pray in here. I've been praying for you today. I've been praying for you today because I know that in this world that, that seeks to just crush our lives, I know that Jesus, Jesus wants to give you a new beginning, a refreshment, a new awakening. He wants to fulfill in you the promise that he put in you before you were ever conceived in your mother's womb. And it doesn't matter how far along the road you are, how new it is or how old it is, God is always working he is the one who can even restore the years that the moths have eaten. He is the God who is able to accomplish in you more than you could ever dream. Because he says you are precious in his sight. No matter how impossible the situation looks, nothing is impossible for God. He loves you. Individually, you are precious in his sight. The world says you are a reject. The world says you are only as good as what you can do for me. It puts our, puts our value in terms of what our output is. But I, somebody told me, you know what? Don't become a human doing. You were made to be a human being first. My dear friends, believe the good news. Believe that you are God's precious one. And he is reaching out to you today, saying you are good enough. You are mine. I love you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yes, indeed. Ricky the cowboy rides again. Yeehaw! <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Thank you for being able to give this story out of the heart of Nebraska. <laughs> oh, Lord, we love you. We need to know you. We call upon your name. Lord, give us courage to let you in and let you work your work in us. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.